Welcome back, everybody, to me talking about Malaz and stuff. Yes, we're back to talk about Assail and uh, chapters 3 and 4, which I read today. I hope I remember everything I wanted to say, because, you know, brains and stuff um, are not usually <laughs> working that well. Also, I didn't sleep much, because... Uh... <clears throat> Insomnia. Also, I had to finish Leviathan Falls, so maybe I'll actually have some thoughts on The Expanse, if anyone's actually <laughs> interested in that. Uh, let me know, and I might actually do something on Leviathan Falls. I don't want to do anything about, like, I don't want to go and reread the rest right now, so I guess it would be a bit pointless, maybe, to just talk about the last one. We'll see. Anyway, until then, let's start with a sale. Well, cheers. All right, so um, <clears throat> where are we with Assail right now? Chapter 3 and 4 are still sort of that roundup thing that is going on. Everyone is on their way to the north, to the north of Assail for all kinds of reasons. And we're basically, I think at this point, we more or less have all our main characters or like met our main groups of characters. Um, Usually, um, Cam Asselmont does not have that many, you know, different viewpoint characters, and we have, like, basically one per group, more or less. Which I personally find an easier way, not an easier, but an easy way to tag along with what's, what Cam Asselmont does. Um, we have our Crimson Guard group, we have, um, where Shimmer is our main viewpoint, we have, um, <clears throat> our like overland raiders, uh, prospectors, what have a have you group where Fisher Caltaf is our main guy. We do have several groups of um, other like people on the sea, <clears throat> and we do have a group in the north, um, which uh, where Oren Oren, I'm so bad with his name. That guy, Organ, whatever, um, is our main viewpoint character, and we have, of course, Silver Fox. That's sort of all we got. Um, so let's let's look at what's going on there, what kind of themes we can pull out of those two chapters, and uh, all the other stuff. Um, so <clears throat> I said before that this one has a lot of like a frontier narrative, frontier story thing, and that's certainly true. And you can, and we tend to think because of you know cultural prejudice that we have in the West, I guess. When we talk about frontier narratives and gold, we usually tend to think North America. And that is definitely an option to do. But one thing that is really clear when we look at chapter four, especially, and uh, the group heading in with Old Bear and Shortshanks he heading into the mountains in the North, um, there's another aspect to that that I feel makes, you know, it's a good, way to look at like, how people, um, how the settings of the Malazan world are a bit unique or feel you more, you know, feel unique compared to a lot of other fantasy. Because there's other aspects that you have that general like frontier um, um, lifestyle kind of feeling there, but the guys up there, the ice bloods, do very much feel... Um, there, there's certainly a, a, a like more like Norse um, cultural thing in there. I don't know how many I've read. Like I wasn't that excited about it, but like something like Shadow of the Gods certainly has similar vibes in a way, especially when it comes to how you know they all go up there and do like the training stuff and to defend that one hearth, that one steading, so to speak, um, to use those words, and. Um, yeah, that's an aspect where we mix several cultures to make specific points because certain um, facets of history, you know, there's a saying that history repeats itself and it kind of does a lot of times. If you just, you know, look at your patterns broad enough and you usually have the idea that, um, and that's one of those things that we see in the Malazan world all the time, right, is that um, more technologically advanced uh, groups um, of people, cultures, civilizations, whatever you want to call them, um, will spread and push back against less technologically advanced um, groups of people with... Um, less technologically advanced ways of life. And that's something that we've seen all over the place with Stephen Erickson's writings and with Cam Asselman's writings, whether it's the end of the Rivi lifestyle in Orb Scepter Throne, whether it's what's happening to the Bargast in Memories of Ice and later on. It's one, it's 
one of the overarching themes of the Malazan world. And we're seeing it here again with an added facet and something that I feel is interesting to look at because it's one of the big themes that tend to be added to <clears throat> the idea of the gold rush or looking for gold because, you know, we have a very weird um, relationship with money and gold in general in the West because of fucking capitalism. And that is that on the one hand, everyone is greedy and is trying to find uh, to gather as much money as possible. I'm no, not a really big ex you know, exception there. It's like, I'd, I'd love to make enough money to actually have an easy life, right? Like everyone wants to have a an easy life. And the system that we currently live in means that you get like a relatively easy um, life without, you know, having to constantly fear for your general amenities and whatnot. Um, you get that through making money. And that's that's a system choice, obviously. And it's a system choice uh, that uh, a lot of people in the Malazan world have also made. And this, and this is like what I mean, like, but it's, it's fascinating because on the one hand, we have, um, you know, called greed one of the seven deadly sins. It's we don't like greedy people. We don't like people that try to get as much money as possible. On the other hand, we at the same time feel that people that have a lot of money are successful and are living the good life. And that's like that weird um, dichotomy is something that we'll see here in the uh, explored in these books as well, because, um, you know, we're talking about gold. And we're talking about people that are out to make a lot of money, and some of them may have like pure motives. Most of them probably just want to make more money and are, um, you know, um, let's just say, have very little regard for anyone that might come in there into their way. And that's something that you know we've seen within the Malazan world before as well. It's something that has obviously moved expansions of, especially a more capitalist-oriented Western culture over the last um, 400, 500 years at least. It's what has made, you know, it's what has driven colon uh, colonialism for a long time. It's what drives a lot of, like, these movements. Um, and it's certainly what we see here is that it is a powerful motivator for a more technologically advanced group of people to expand, subjugate, terrorize, exterminate, or whatever, anyone who comes into the way of that, um, of their wealth, their expansion, and their search for monetary wealth. And I feel the interesting bit that we'll see here, and we have seen before, is that we're talking about systems here. We're talking about a larger movement, a larger drive. We're not exactly talking about the individuals. Some of those are obviously very greedy and bad people, some of them are not, and it's kind of that that different, that, that important aspect, right, that we are aware of the fact that because those people are caught up in that system, it's a, it's a very, it's, it takes a lot of effort and a conscious choice and a possibility to step out of that system, to say no to that specific way of life and uh, do something else. And Yes, the group around Old Bear has that option, and they take that option, but not everyone has. Leaving behind that system is not as easy as it may seem. Well, it, it seems easy to Orwin, or whatever his name is. Orwin? I think Orwin. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll learn it by tomorrow, I promise. But not everyone has that option. The same goes... Um, for another group that encounters um, rampant capitalism, I'm talking obviously about the Crimson Guard and their encounter with the Letheriae, um group, um, whose name I've already forgotten. But the guys that have like basically claimed an island and call it like their private property and so forth. Now this is probably one of the most in-your-face um, criticisms of capitalist behavior. I've seen from Cam Esselmont so far. It's on par with what's going on in Reaper Scale and part of Midnight Tide by Steven Erickson. Because obviously they're also dealing with um, the Letheriae in that regard. Um, but Cam Esselmont being the person he is, he, he tends to, you know, um, 
use irony and over, you know irony to show how ridiculous that kind of thing is. It's it's exaggeration and irony that's going on there a lot. It is very very dark, obviously at the same time, but you know. <laughs> At least the idea that they've claimed the whole thing for shit, which, you know, yes, there are, like, uses for, um, for bird guano in chemistry and whatnot, but it's, it's still, it's, it, it is, it points out the ridiculousness of claiming land, um, as private property, and, uh, you know, and all the ridiculousness that comes from that. Blame John Locke. Well, I mean, it's always a good idea to blame John Locke, but, you know, um, so that, that part, I feel, is interesting, because the Crimson Guard does not really understand that. But it's also important to know that the Crimson Guard, with Shimmer, Bars, and company, are a highly privileged group. They are more than just human, apparently. They are extremely powerful, um, militarily powerful. They can just go and take whatever they want. They don't have. They don't have to abide by the rules. <laughs> of a larger society, unless they want to, which is exactly why they became the Crimson Guard, because they wanted, they defied the Empire and didn't want to become part of the Empire and its society. But that's, that's, that's exactly what is, um, what we can draw out there as a lesson that I feel is important to understand is that for most of, most of us, most people, um, the choice whether we abide by a specific system, a specific economic or whatever society, a societal system, or not, is not a choice at all because we are we don't have enough whatever you want to call it potential, um, privilege, agency, whatever to actually make that choice in a lot of cases. And why am I bringing this up? It's it it's especially with Auburn and the gang when they're like deciding to leave the gold behind and but you know while all the, while all that criticism that old bear heaps on like grubbing for gold becoming enslaved to gold and all of that is obviously um, true in a lot of ways it is also a choice that a lot of people don't have and it's important to not get too high on our moral horses, um, high horses, to actually, to, um, and condemn everyone working within a capitalist system, because most people don't have the choice, most people don't have the choice, and that's sort of something that we'll see, hopefully, explored more in the coming chapters, because otherwise, you know, the idea of, like, living wild and living free up there in the hills, in nature, and not in all the sooty cities where everyone is corrupt and the air is bad and the food is bad. That's a bit very, very black and white and not in a good way. Because once again, not everyone has the chance and choice to do that. And that's sort of what I feel is important to, to keep in mind. Even today when we talk about how you know sustainable life could work. Sustainable life is difficult to afford for a lot of us, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so we do see that here. Another thing, however, is obviously the scene with Erwin when he kills his uncle with the spear and becomes a kinslayer. Um, this also, I feel, is interesting because what it shows is that the Lowlanders and the Ice Blood, Ice Bloods here, both abide by very similar cultural constraints and rules. There is a clan structure, there's an honor family structure in the, in place there that is maybe slowly corrupted or slowly um, taken over by a more modern viewpoint, more modern, um, less rigid society, a society or societal model in the South, coming with more prospectors and all the other people, that influx of different cultures. But it is still very much rooted in both the Lowlander culture and the Iceblood culture, in a way. Um, is that good or bad? That's a good question, but <clears throat> I feel it's important to see that they are not that different in that regard. Just like one of them is willing to change over time, while the other group has decided to defy change completely. Will that work? Probably not. Um, we'll see and find out in the next couple of chapters, um, is my guess. All right, so much for that whole thing. Let's have a look at a few other things. Yeah. 
Now, obviously, um, I've said that before, um, Cam Asselman loves to write about boats, which is great because he's good at writing about boats and ships. He knows his sailing vessels and the stuff that's going on on the sea. That's, that's really cool. But what he also knows, and what I also appreciate about what Cam Asselman does writing-wise, depending on which book we're talking about, he knows his horror. And um, over time, a lot of Cam Asselman's novels of the Malazan Empire do have um, all their own specific aspects of horror, like of the horror genre, whether it is you're digging up some old curse kind of thing in Orb Scepter Throne, whether it is the very, very explicit, I don't want to call it body, uh, my body horror and, and so forth, that we, existential horror that we see in um, Blood and Bone, or whether it is something that we have not seen a lot of before, that being the classic ghost story, the haunted house, or in this case, the haunted ship, because haunted ships are really cool. Um, and that's the one aspect that we have with that one boat. Um, I keep forgetting the name of the boat. Um, is that a strike? No, it's not the strike. It's a different one. Anyway, that that one ship uh, on uh, that we have seen that meets uh, in in the Sea of Dread. And there's there's a bunch of aspects there. On the one hand, it is just made uh, as a short story. It is just a great horror story. A quick one. You could you could just extract that one and turn it into its own horror short story. Or Love, almost Lovecraftian kind of, or like the fog, or whatever kind of horror story of a ship trapped in in fog, becalmed in fog, and one one crew member after the other going missing, and it's once again as a vignette, it would work as an individual short story, and it's just a really well done one. And now the question obviously is why does um, <clears throat> why does that whole thing work as a horror story? Um, I guess there's a bunch of things. One of them is, um, obviously, the thing that makes a lot of horror horror is um, the loss of control, the loss of agency, a lack of information. That's what we as humans, because as I said before, agency is something that defines us a lot. We want to be in control. We want to know what is going on and feel like we're in control. If you take away that control... In a lot of cases, that will very much frighten us. That's a very animalistic thing, right? It's like same with most animals. You you tie them up, you take away their control. They like a lot of animals will panic. So having a situation where we have limited control, which is any situation that we have, if we're going to sea on a boat, it has probably become easier these days. I've it's been a while since I was on a boat. I, I did some sailing when I was younger on like a small sailing boat, but only on like Lake Constance, which isn't, you know, <laughs> that dangerous a place. You can still die there in the water. But it's like you are deliberately like venturing out into an environment that is inimical to you, to us as humans, um, and is impossible to fully control. So we have already like a start why, why the sea is... Um, a good setting for any form of like tense storytelling, whether it's your existential like sea wolf stories by Jack London or all kinds of maritime horrors. That's exactly the thing. It's like, this is not our world. The ocean is not our world. We can venture out there, but it's always just trying to not get caught by the powers out there. Plus, we add another one with the Sea of uh, Dread, which is fog. Fog or mist is also a great theme for horror, right? Because what it does, it is it, it actually visually limits our control and our knowledge because we can't see shit. Um, there's stuff out there that we might not see. There's dangers out there that we are not aware of, so we can't react to them until it's too late. <clears throat> so having a place where we already know that we are not in control and then also taking away our options to um, actually react to something in a timely fashion. Prepare for whatever is out there. That makes it even more scary. So that's already the basis of why those characters in that story can, you know, feel feel scared. It's why you have a lot of um, superstitions around the ocean, sea, seafaring, and so forth. Um, and it's why that makes for a great ghost story. And then you have the, your basic setup. Eh? There's a mystery. People are 
vanishing. That's once again some one of those things, especially because they're vanishing without any information of what is going on. Once again, we're taking away information. It's the lack of information, it's the lack of control, and it's the lack of um yeah, uh, agency that makes it so scary. And it's just a classic. And it's a classic, it has been a classic for um horror on ships, it has been a classic forever, and uh Cam Esselman just shows that he's really good at just translating that into the Malazan world because this is the other thing that makes any like good fantasy world a good fantasy world. In a good fantasy world, you can tell any possible story. Any story that you can tell in our world as what you might call realistic fiction. You can also tell in a fantasy world because it's about very human things. It's about those effects. You can tell that story in the Malazan world and you can tell it unlike a normal ship in our world. It would work exactly the same way. And that's just like one of the things that we can see here. Plus, once again, Cam Asselman shows us that he's a master of all kinds of subgenres and different um, aspects of the more fantastical side of fiction in general. And yeah, I just wanted to point that out because I love that whole aspect, the way it is made. It's just really cool. All right. What else is interesting? Uh, you remember when I said that it's interesting to look at how this is the world after the great events of the, the crippled god of blood and bone, the crippled god is gone, a lot of the gods of war have vanished. There's a general um, reordering of the universe, both on the human level and on the uh, divine level. And it's that's one of the things that makes this book so fascinating to me. It's like that we see how this whole thing shakes out now that the big, you know, the big chaos has gone. The big, like, big events have happened. And this is sort of like that short span after, like, those big contestants have gone off the board where everyone is scrambling to find out the lay of the land, the new lay of the land, see if they can get something for themselves, how to actually find meaning in a world where maybe your god has gone. And that's something that we see with the Blue Shields, sworn to Tog and Fandere. And now we've read the crippled god, so we kind of know what happens to those two, right? They're gone. Gods of war have not had a good fate in recent, a good time in recent history. Um, so seeing them fulfilling a final obligation to their god and trying to also find out who they'll be next is one of these aspects. The idea of like having a new land, and this is something that I like about how Essail works, right? Is that we have the continent of Assail and everyone going there as a new world, basically, is an image, is a metaphor for all of the Malazan universe. That is sort of a new place now that the crippled god's gone and all of these other gods gods have gone. and It's a metaphor for that. And sadly, so far, humanity, in this case, mostly humanity, is not exactly doing a good job at actually taking that new chance they've been given, that second chance that they've been given. Because it is sort of a second chance. It's something that I guess I would like to talk about in a, specific, in a separate video, which is like how in how much all of that is about like the sentient species of the Malazan world getting a second chance at not fucking up everything. And um, so far, they're not doing a good job. Just saying. <laughs> because everyone is going there, um, taking apart the next world. It's a very... It shows a rapaciousness that is, in the long run, not a good thing. All right, what else should we look at? <clears throat> yeah, the mystery of our um, Crimson Guard and Kaaz being able to walk underwater. Um, <laughs> well, at least he's not walking on water, which, you know, is kind of awkward, but <clears throat> there's something going on with the, um, with the Crimson Guard, and we've, like, it's been building up ever since Return of the Crimson Guard, I guess. Um, that is about the nature of the vow, of what is going on there, <clears throat> how extremely tough the avowed are, if there's, like, any, like, price to be paid on that um and that's something that we'll probably hopefully find out at some point um 
But apparently they have even more powers. And yes, Kaz and, um, well, Cowl may seem to know, and the rest is still walking in the dark. Um, but apparently it's not a magical thing that's going on. Or not magic in that regard. Um, it'll still take a while, I guess. It could be next chapter or the chapter after. Like chapter 5 or 6 could be the one when we talk about what's going on with the Crimson Guard. I think. From my memories, which are rather um, all over the place. All right. Um, what else is interesting? Um, the um, well, the sea battle that we have with like the the anchor chain and the rag stopper. So we have an, one of the old guard is still around. It's Carthur on crust, which is cool. Um, plus the gray, the blue shields. Plus um, those two other groups. They the the Falari um, sailors with the blind. Um, which that is doing all this stuff. There might be actually something in there, like the, the portrayal of blindness in fantasy books that I could possibly look at a bit more. Um, but maybe not. We'll see. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it's just like a really cool like sea battle. The idea of how, how wrecking um, and piracy have always been part of seafaring. And one aspect that I feel like Cam Aslan gets right that I appreciate a lot about this is the fact that um, most seafaring in the Malazan world here in, and in our world as well for a long time is along coastlines. You stay close to the coast because the weather is not that bad. You can land and refresh your supplies and whatnot. That's why it took so long for a lot of us <laughs> humans to actually do stuff like crossing over from Europe to America or whatever because there you don't have those options. But, on the other hand, if all your ships are driving past your coast, um, temptation to act for piracy in that regard is obviously a, um, you know, an important thing. And it's uh, a tempting thing. And I feel it's interesting in, a re in some way because the way we think about sailing ships and about generally, like, seafaring and we think about piracy is usually everyone is just somewhere in the absolute nowhere of the of the open ocean and they still manage to, <laughs> to find each other and, uh, well, shoot cannon at, at each other and that's it. So, no, usually what you do is you hang out somewhere near the coast and wait for someone else to drive uh, to sail past and then you attack them and then if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, you hide somewhere in a river delta until <laughs> everyone, <laughs> everyone is gone again and you can try with the next group and that's something that I once again shows that Cam Asselman knows his ships and stuff because that's exactly what he shows like the, the actual ocean crossing is dangerous and brutal which is why you know the Crimson Guard has to land on the Letheri, Letheri Island well it's not the island but you know the one they claim for their own <clears throat> and it's you know that ongoing thing there so just another point where like the ship Ship stuff is just really good on this in this book once again. All right, now let's look at um, Silver Fox again for a bit. I feel Silver Fox is a fascinating character. I've always said so. Um, the Silver Fox does do a lot of interesting things, or the character of Silver Fox does do a lot of interesting things with that other big, big topic of the Malazan world, and that is children and parentage. And when you look at how Silver Fox is created, Silver Fox is the example of a child that has been overburdened um, by their parents' expectations. And it's something that I guess a lot of us know. It's like our parents having great expectations for us, thinking that we can solve all kinds of problems, become geniuses, a genii, whatever, um, <laughs> um, or whatever, um, or do something better that they fucked up. It's it's an ongoing situation that a lot of ch like parents and children are involved in. And Silver Fox um, exemplifies that extremely well through having those parts of her soul through having the expectation of the Talani mass to solve all their problems, um, and well, almost no guidance how to deal with that. And what happens in such situations, and this is once again why Silver Fox is such a good character, 
is that people, that children need room and space to be children. Silver Fox never got that chance, which is why she grows old so fast. She has to grow up extremely fast. There's a, there's obviously a, a symbolism that there's like, a, it's a metaphor, obviously. I'm, I'm throwing around words in the wrong way. Anyway, point is, it, it makes it very directly clear how too much pressure on a child can destroy their childhood and thus um, influence their entire life. Now, do those Talani Mass have good reason to have such high hopes in her and have such high expectations of her? Yes, of course. And that's that's the tragic part, is for, in a lot of cases, when children are forced to grow up extremely fast, the people that put on those high expectations on them and that pressure that forces them to grow up don't have much of a choice or at least don't see that they have much of a choice to not do that. And that's... That's another thing, once again, the idea is like blaming people. Is, blame, blaming people is always very easy, but looking at how, you know, most of them don't actually have much alternatives, many alternatives, is important too. That's why we need to have compassion, right? <laughs> it's something that I've heard the Malazan world does kind of, you know, need sometimes, or want sometimes. Anyway, um... We kind of see more of what's going on there, and I feel that's that's like the other big theme here. It's like one that we have also seen a lot before, and that is the whole like Talana Mass, um, Jakut story, and war. <clears throat> and why is that an important thing? So, the idea here is to let go, <clears throat> to be able to let go. The Talana Mass at this point have one reason to exist. We can't call it life, obviously. One reason to exist at all, alone. And that is, that one reason is to kill every single Jackhood or, you know, Jackhood adjacent being, I guess. And that's sort of where, that's sort of where the conflict is like, do you decide that humans that are kind of descended or, um, taught by the Jakut, also need ex to be exterminated. And if you decide that, why do you do that? Do you do that because you truly believe that? Or do you do that because you need a purpose in life? And being aware of why we do the things we do, and being aware of why we choose specific purposes for our lives, is once again an important thing, something that we need to do consciously, and that we tend to not do consciously a lot of times. And seeing that split through the Talana Mass with one group, the Karloon, deciding to hold on to the war, and another side trying to actually um, end the war, forgive or not, choose to end that war, is... Um, well, it's it's both it's both a metaphor for societies, but also for ourselves, right? We, when we tend to look at like what we do, there's always like if you continue like a specific quest, I don't want to call it quest, but like a specific route in your life, there's at least at least for me, there's often that point where like I said I will do this and this and this, and then I keep on doing that and banging my head against the wall for ages and ages, and then there's a part of myself, part of me that is getting more and more tired of it and like literally more and more tired and like, I can't deal with this anymore and then you come to that point where you need because so much of your uh, of our identity so much of our like feeling of self is tied into such things into causes we like causes are such a huge part of who we think we are that backing out of something backing out of that kind of thing is extremely difficult and is an ongoing conflict and having that um pictured as the um, battle or like almost civil war within the Talana Mass, I feel is a very powerful image for that kind of conflict that we ourselves oftentimes have when it comes to trying to accept that maybe we um, are holding on to a specific project, a specific goal, a specific thing far longer than we should. All right, our Tyst and AI has woken up. That's like all we can say because there's not that much like actually interesting going on with Fisher. We get a bit of like marine banter, which is cool. We get a 
first hint that Mal of Greece is doing more than just looking for gold. They're constructing um, maps. They're writing new maps. They're doing a land survey. Uh, survey. We'll see where that will be going in the future. But right now, there's not that much going on. Just that our Thai stand AI has no rec recollection who he is, making it even more difficult. It's like, who the fuck is that dude? <laughs> or is it maybe a completely different Thai stand AI that we have never met before? Who knows? Um, Fisher doesn't know, no one else does. So there, there's that, and we'll see where it will be going in the near future. I guess the more interesting aspect here is, once again, the idea that sometimes, sometimes rumors and stories are kind of true. And we have that here with the idea of like all those maps being very like inaccurate and more like inventions than anything else, or that's what they, what the Malazans think. But on the other hand, Fisher's like, yo, you know, no one crossing that ridge has ever come back, so maybe there is something going on there. It may just be like super scary or something, or you know, something else. And Fisher brings up an important point. And that is, once again, like the perspective thing, right? Um, the Malazan's like, yeah, there's probably bandits in those hills. And he's like, no, 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 they're not bandits that want our, like, money. Maybe those people are just defying, the, you know, defending their territory. And why is that important? Because the Malazans in this group come from a, you know, feudal place that has then become, like, the empire. They don't even understand the idea of tribal lands anymore. <laughs> that connection with the land you live on, that is part of that more like tribal culture that is still prevailing in uh, prevailing in um, a sale, is alien to them. It's one of those things that we, we I guess, need to talk about more in the future. With um, this, like what you might call the march of progress or whatever you want to call it, the invasion of a technologically uh, more advanced. Um, group of people following a different worldview, we tend to apply our worldview to other people, uh, to, to other places, because of arrogance. And, yeah, the, the downside of that is that we we sometimes completely misunderstand why we why people might not be happy with our behavior. Um, and unlike in our world, the Malazan world, because it has magic and stuff like that, um, gives a lot of these groups, um, those marginalized groups that you might call marginalized um, tribes and whatnot, um, a fighting chance. At least the chance to do a lot of fucking damage. It doesn't change things in the end, but it makes it at least a, a bit more costly for the arrogant colonizers to actually do the colonizing and whatnot. So, there we are right now. Um, <clears throat> everyone is going is slowly heading north for whatever reasons. Um, there seems to be something magical going on there as well. There's the idea that in the far north there live people that will grant every wish, but be careful what you wish for. Um, there's suddenly a more like legendary, mythical overtone to the whole thing. Um, we'll see where all of that is going in the near future. Um, but we already have that general like movement. Everyone is going north to that one place that is Possibly the the last like fully unconquered un you know that one place where humans have not gone before or not gone in a long time kind of place because even even in blood in blood and bone even in Jakaruku there's a lot of humans hang, hanging around everywhere so we'll see what is going on there in the next couple of chapters I'll talk about those tomorrow until then. Thanks for watching. Uh, please like, subscribe, be a nice person, share it if you feel like sharing, whatever. Do the good things and uh, have a great Monday and I'll talk to you tomorrow. And until then, cheers.